Rolling. Perfect. Karen, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You know, you're a very busy person. You know, you are orthopedic surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgery, team physician for U.S. Lacrosse, and the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Team, chief medical officer for World Lacrosse, also a triathlete, and a mother of four. The first thing, going through all this, how do you have enough, how do you get, where's the time come from? How do you fit all that in? I think I just don't like to sleep, so I like to stay active. (laughs) Um, No, in all seriousness, I I just have been able to find things that I have a lot of passion for and have been able to follow those routes. And I think that if that's incorporated into your life, then some of the busy work things that you may have thought that were necessary and required earlier on in your life, you learn to streamline. So I think you can focus on the main buckets that Mm -hmm. give you a lot of joy and satisfaction in your life and your career and family and friends and get rid of some of the extraneous stuff. Now, where did that kind of passion start for you? I think probably I have always been very competitive. I guess growing up from the age of six, I started playing piano and that was probably one of the hardest things I did because I had to compete, do these concertos in front of tons of people, work with orchestras. So it was pretty stressful at at a young age, but then I realized I enjoyed the competition. And then I did a lot of equestrian activities growing up, so showed horses. And then finally, I think the passion, my main passion would come from sports and youth sports and and keeping people healthy playing sports. Mm -hmm. And that probably started maybe around high school or late middle school where I started playing lacrosse and just absolutely loved it. So every day going out there, working hard, I would work out with the football players in the weight room, anybody who would join me for a workout. And that's still the case right now. Um, My boss and I just worked out at 4.15 in the morning the other day. Um, So any way that you can, you know, just improve yourself, I, I think is a really cool thing to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Getting those endorphins going, 415. That is... Uh... Yeah, that was not my choice. I think he <laughs> okay, no. challenged me, and so <laughs> the initial go was 5 a.m., and he's like, well, how about 430? And my friend chimed in, he's like, there's no way she's backing down. She's Whatever time you're going to mention, she's going to do. So, yeah, we had a nice boxing and core workout at 415 in the morning. So where does that kind of... Have you always kind of had that attitude? Like, okay, you know, she's not going to show up. Nope, she'll be there. She'll be ready to go and kind of ready and raring. I mean, it kind of sounds sounds like you've uh, kind of been that driven from a super early age. Yeah, I'd say so. I think if you're going into the field of medicine, you will not survive if you don't commit to showing up when you need to, reading what you need to, studying the tests that you need to. Um, it, it weaves people out pretty quickly. Um, mm-hmm. It starts in college. Uh, when I was at Duke, we had the chemistry class that you first started, an intro to chemistry, was filled with about 20, 250 people. Many of those were pre-med. And then kind of as you get to sophomore year, junior year, I was a chemistry major there and graduated with only about 11 other chem majors. So everything kind of whittles down as you go through. Um, but I, I love chemistry too. So I, it was really just, I think, subject matters and things that I like to do, I, yeah, I won't back down from achieving as much as I can with those opportunities. Yeah, no, I mean, it's certainly, I mean, looking at the uh, laundry list on the resume, I mean, it's certainly impressive. And like I said, I'm, I'm amazed at how you're able to, to fit in that time. Cause I know for a lot of people, one of the uh, difficult things that they have is trying to figure out uh, time management and how, when it comes into goal setting or figuring things out like that, that they really kind of, uh, struggle or kind of lack in that category? I think sometimes somebody gave me the advice where in terms of goal setting, you set your goal, but then don't just leave it there on a piece of paper. You actually have to know the little tiny baby steps and not steps that we see to walk up to a big castle, but just little tiny steps to get there and start to put the base level of the pyramid together. What are the connections that you need to get there? What are the skills that you need to get there? Mm -hmm. And, And I think it's, it's nice to work backwards because then you can see how you can get there as opposed to goals being so lofty that if you don't make them more concrete, then you're never going to achieve them. Right. Yeah, no, it definitely, it, it seems like people kind of will put out that big goal and then it, it's hard for them to find the way to kind of, to kind of get there. One of the ones that I always, uh, 
liked was uh, think about it as a, as acronym SMART, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So like you that. can kind of be able to keep track of, of whether the goal actually is SMART, how you're able to kind of break that down and everything. So it's, yeah, it's just one of those things, especially with a bunch of the guests that I've had on that trying to figure out time because, you know, that is the fixed ratio, right? You got 24 right. hours in a day. How are you going to be able to break things down? You know, with different athletes that I've had on and stuff like that, they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I maximize my uh, sleep? You know, I need to make sure I'm at least getting like eight or nine hours. And then how is my day going to kind of build in from there? And so I'm just amazed, you know, it's a uh, kudos to you, mother, you know, being able to, to fit all that into my day, you know, you're making me feel really lazy over here. I'm going to get my well, ass in gear. You know, I, I have to give credit to, um, you know, everybody that's involved in my life and I have a great support system. Mm -hmm. So I think that's critical. Sure. And you do have to learn, I would say, I was talking to my nanny the other day and we were kind of conversing with a first time mom and it's a little different with your first child compared to your fourth. <laughs> um, you're able to let go a little bit. I think when I have had my first child, I wanted to be with him all the time. I felt like I had to be the one to feed him and to change his diaper and to wake up when, when he woke up at night. And I was dedicated to everything that he needed in, in life at that time. Um, but I think that changes with the children and you're able to relinquish a little bit of that control and people can help you. It's okay if somebody else takes your child for a walk in the stroller. That's all of that's okay. Um, right. it, you do have to relinquish a little bit of control of the of certain tasks in your life. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, relinquishing a little bit of that control is, is definitely a, a good thing to allow you to focus on all those different areas that you have going on and your other different passions. And one of those things is, is dealing with athletes when they're at their most vulnerable. I mean, that is such a, a difficult situation. I've been through it. I mean, I toured my ACL and that is like the dark times and um, you're trying to figure out what is the course ahead? What's the, what's the right action? And, and so kind of just go through for me, like your, your approach to that, because you I mean, you are dealing with all these, uh, differing psychologies and thoughts like I need to you know I need to take more time because I don't trust it or I need to rush back and you just there's there's so many different attitudes and kind of thought process when it comes to injury and I'm, I'm just kind of curious how you're able to to bounce from person to person I think the first thing is as a physician to be able to relate and understand what the athlete's going through just like you said it it is the darkest time and when we publish in the literature, ACL research, and it just sounds like a word right there. But then when you see the person and a big injury has happened to them, whether it's a, a big shoulder dislocation or an ACL tear, you realize that it is gonna be a long haul for that athlete. And I think, first of all, just understand, I try to get what the athlete's goals are in the future. So going through after the injury, I try to understand how competitive the athlete is. You know, sometimes people will go through playing soccer in high school, tear their ACL their senior year, and then they say, look, I just want to run marathons and be kind of a straightforward athlete after this, as opposed to continuing with pivoting cutting. So all of those first come into one, the emotional connection with the athlete. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons that I enjoy continuing to work out and continuing to challenge myself, because I think it does allow me to understand the passion that athletes go through and the hard work and dedication and grit that they put into their training. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I think is being able to relate to the athlete. The second is listening. So there's done a lot of studies where doctors tend to, you know, the patient will come into the office and we just start asking questions. So you don't just sit there and listen. Mm -hmm. You can garner a lot from just sitting and listening to the person for a while and understanding how everything happens and um, what their fears are. Um, coming out of this as well. Sure. Then I think the next things are, you know, obviously planning the surgery, but then it's great to get a team together. So it's great to have, oftentimes we work with a sports nutritionist, a physical therapist, a strength and conditioning coach. Um, we work with um, sports psychology and just everybody, the coaches, put it, putting everything together is really important. So it's, it's great to have that team approach to treating athletes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how much has that team approach kind of helped just your approach when, when kind of dealing with them? You know, you, I'm sure that you know, sports nutritionist, sports psych, I mean, there's all this kind of great uh, ocean of knowledge and pool of knowledge you guys are kind of able to learn and share. So how much, is, how much does that kind of help you? 
It's great. The first thing I usually work with is if we have the research from a performance coach, it's nice to see where the athlete was before the ACL injury. So getting some background. Mm -hmm. In terms of the nutrition, I do find a lot of athletes are usually undernourished, um, not to the point where there's an eating disorder or something that is clinically based. But a lot of times there's not enough nutrients going in for the activity that they're doing. So it does give us a time to stop and think about, look, here are all the requirements from the activities that you're doing, but what are you putting into your body? So it, oftentimes athletes will come out knowing their body a lot better after the injury than they did beforehand. And then when we're talking about sports psychology, one of the biggest reasons for athletes to not get back on the field or on the snow is they are nervous. They don't really trust that ACL. Mm -hmm. And they've done tons of research in our orthopedic literature as well, just showing, look, the ACL could be completely stable. They've gotten their quad strength. All of their functional movement tests are off the charts. But then we're seeing that that being a little bit timid, getting, getting back on the um, field or snow or wherever they are. Um, and so the sports psychologist really helps to delve into gaining that confidence back. Yeah, I mean, it is really one of those, uh, if you're an athlete and you get hurt, it's one of those things you have to have to go through. I know for me, it was definitely, there's a period of time where you you need to be able to just like, hey, let it go, let it come back, like every, everything's going to be okay. And one of the things for me, I know when I was going through like my rehab and stuff like that, is that I didn't want to come back with a brace. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be, if I was coming back, I was coming back and I didn't want to wear a brace. So however long a period of time that that took, that's fine. Like I didn't want to yeah. have that thought. Cause I, th cause at least to me, I felt like, all right, if I'm wearing a brace, that means that, you know, I'm still thinking about it or I still kind of have that little 2% chance. So I, that means I didn't do enough in my rehab. I didn't do an, I didn't put enough work in there. Um, so at least for me, that helped me kind of compartmentalize it. And like, but it is one of those things. I mean, there's just more and more of those ACL injuries, right? Because you have so much more sport and it seems to be happening at a younger age. Yeah, I think one thing that we talk about is sports specialization. A lot of athletes, which is great. So by the time you turn 13, 15, it's fine to start doing some sports specialization where you're only participating in, in that sport alone. But we were starting to see it a lot earlier where seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds are getting sucked into, they'll play recreational sports, but then they'll play their club team and then they'll play their winter league. And then the summer is filled with just camps of the same sport. And that's actually detrimental in their career. One, for the chance of burning out sooner. I mean, by the time they actually have looked at some statistics, I don't know specifically what it is, but the kids that are playing Little League World Series, pretty much none of them ever go to MLB or let alone MLB World Series because they're over, you know, everything's overused by that, by that time and they get, they get burnt out. Um, so as opposed to Japan, some of the pitchers actually start pitching way later in life and so they're peaking at a, at a much different age than, than some of our little leaders so the sports specialization sports specialization i think is critical where we want kids to play tons of different sports and see what they like and be able to use different muscle groups and that helps to prevent uh injury so if we can focus on that that's a small win Right. Well, it's also like part of it is like the growth. I mean, if you're throwing balls from when you're seven years old, I mean, it takes a while for you to actually like develop and everything else. I mean, I, I remember reading something about Tommy John surgery and like 12 year olds is like through the roof. It's like, how are kids getting Tommy John surgery at 12? That's crazy. Yep. And then he <laughs> wants to do surgery before, you know, playing in a career. And then the other cool thing we have now is I think the performance coaches have been amazing. You know, at Part of my partnership, as much as I'm a surgeon, is a lot of times either with physical therapy or performance training, I can get these athletes, if they don't have a big injury, mm -hmm. back out there. And so it's, it's fun to make those connections. And I'm, I'm always trying to improve myself when I talk to the performance coaches and ask them, you know, what's their favorite move that they do. I, I always want to learn something new for the weight room, too. No, that's good. And how much does that help kind of with your with your uh, triathlons and stuff like that? I mean, when, when did you kind of start getting into that? Was that after you finished lacrosse? Uh, so triathlons, it was probably, so if you're talking kind of about the dark times of ACLs, I would say the dark <laughs> time for me was going from playing college across and, you know, going to the final four, being a captain there, to all of a sudden in medical school where you're just beat down and, you know, you're just one of the masses studying as much biology, chemistry, you know, all the, all the different pathophysiology that you can. 
And so I needed to find something, you know, mentally, mm-hmm. I was like, I can't sit at my desk and just study 24 seven. So I started picking up on marathons during that time, just because it was easy to, you know, run out of study hall, you don't need a lot of equipment and start running the streets of Baltimore where I was. Um, and then triathlons, my brother used to do cycling, he used to race um, okay. doing cycling. And so he got me involved in starting to feel more confident riding on the roads. Um, Whereas before, I think if it weren't for him, I was just a little bit more timid in terms of really getting out in traffic and, and being confident because you can't be indecisive as you're doing your road cycling. It can be really sure. dangerous. So yeah. he helped me with that. And then I, I tried to channel my inner summer swim team to <laughs> get that swimming back. Finally, I've gotten a, a coach and try to improve my swim stroke, but that's probably my weakest of the, of the triathlon length there. So it was, a, it was a, an evolution probably mm-hmm. when medical school started. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, and, and it's speaking to that, it's trying to find something after sports end is, you know, such a such a difficult thing for a lot of people. It was actually, uh, I don't know if you've seen a documentary on HBO, The Way to Gold, that yeah. was really kind of insightful and kind of interesting just with Olympic athletes and, and different people in general of when sport kind of ends, how do you find out what the next steps are and things of that nature. I mean, for you, luckily, you were I mean, your attitude and just how driven you are, it's boom, right into the next thing. You knew you wanted to go into the medical field and um, you're absolutely knocking that out of the park. So it, it, it was but, hard though. I mean, sure. I just, you know, finishing up at Duke and mm-hmm. I, I just felt like I had all my friends, all my support system, my, my Duke lacrosse friends. We actually talk about how therapeutic the locker room was, you know, having that locker room going in it was this sacred place it's almost like Vegas you know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas and the locker room was this sacred zone where if you were having a bad day something happened that you didn't feel like you could share with anybody else that was the time to kind of it it was therapy it it truly was and um and we didn't have to pay for a psychologist at the time we just (laughs) let loose um and so by the time you got on the field you felt like you got through all the mental challenges and then you were ready to focus but we, we always say we wish we had that locker room back again and could uh, share that thought with everybody. Yeah, no, I mean, that's always one of the things, right? They always talk about it, like, if you're, whether you're done playing high school football or whether it's done, like, once that's kind of, that, that journey's over, it really is, like, over. You yeah. know, it's one of those things that everyone, I, I feel like as much as your parents and everyone tells you, like, hey, you need to enjoy this, it's going to be a great experience, and then, boom, the next thing, it's gone, and then it really is gone, and you're like, huh. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't lying. <laughs> Terrible. I know. Terrible. <laughs> so for you, what are like some of the main habits that you would say, um, at least for you personally, that kind of help you succeed or kind of help you uh, prioritize the day? I know you said you got a great team around you and stuff like that, but what, what kind of uh, habits would you say that are, are for you that work best? The first would be consistency. So trying to keep either a daily consistency or weekly consistency going. So I do use a lot of schedules, organizing techniques. That probably centers around my day. I make a lot of lists. Um, I'm trying to see any in my office, but there's just, you know, tons of like little lists that I'm writing down and trying to check the boxes. Perfect. Um, So that's the first step. Two is waking up early. I try to wake up at the same time every time, uh, every day. Okay. So it's usually somewhere around, um, unfortunately, Wednesday, it was 3.45, but usually usually it's closer to, you know, 5 a.m. and I start to get some sort of workout before the day. And then the next thing would be, I really try to surround myself with people that help me grow and have a positive mindset. Mm-hmm. I think that that's been extremely helpful, especially during this COVID pandemic, too, where people can get really down, you know, and, and we're going through this with the, the election too, where people just get lost and, and can't get out of their own head. Um, and I found that the people that I train with, work out with, that I work with, they all have this, let's go get it, you know, just what do you, what do you want? And, and let's go get it done and get out there and accomplish whatever you need to. And it may not be pretty. It may not, you may not achieve your goals, but let's try, you know, it, it mm-hmm. doesn't hurt to fail and, and see what you can do out there. No, absolutely. That's, I mean, that's a great, that's a great way to, those are some great, it's a great list there for sure to think of. And one thing when you talk about with like waking up, it goes back to that consistency of waking up kind of at the same time every morning or, you know, 
hopefully not 345 as you say you know, <laughs> <laughs> but there is one thing about uh at, at least for me you know being able to kind of get that workout in pretty much every day like on, yeah. a, on that consistent basis you know that that release of endorphins that that you're able to get um so when you're going through and, and you get your workout in how do you break that is it usually like you're running or you're sweat like if, for a triathlete i don't really know how do you is mm -hmm. it like monday wednesday friday you run Tuesday, Thursday, you swim, like what's kind of the breakdown? Yeah, just so I, I work with a coach and usually what happens is the theme of it. So Monday through Friday, you're doing some sort of workout. Usually it's single events for me. So my distance that I've been kind of in the zone with is the half Ironman distance. Um, I'm trying to do a, a full next year. But for the half Ironman, usually it's about one, one event per day so running cycling and then maybe you might end with a job just to get that transition going because you always want to get some sort of transition going okay. um so usually for me it was two days a week um going to an open water swim so we have a nice um the, the long island sound is, is where i'll do my open water swim and partner with a couple people you gotta keep that safe and have people watching you then a couple days a week do um, cycling and then running. And then I always try to fit in strength and conditioning training. But then on the weekend is where you try to fit in your really long um, endurance runs, rides or swims. And that may even be a smaller triathlon event too that you're just doing on your own to get those transitions in. But the weekend you do have to commit a lot. And that's where, because I have four kids and all their sporting events happen on the weekends, that, that might have a, a wake up time with a four in front of it if I need to, because I do want to be there. Um, it's fun to see their competitive spirit and watch them get after it on the soccer field or the lacrosse field too. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, if, if, like just, just even there really speaks at least to me listening to you, like your, your dedication to want to make sure you get everything in. I mean, I think that that, that commitment is, can be really hard to find in a lot of people of like, okay, like, it is the weekend. I shouldn't be getting up earlier. I should be, you know, I'll sleep in, go watch the kids kind of do their thing. I mean, where, where does that kind of drive and, and dedication kind of uh, come from for you? I love it. There, uh, the, just, first, yeah. the first half Ironman I ran uh, or I, I competed in, I cried at the end. It was, it's just so cool to see what your body can accomplish. And, it, and it's different now. So I'm, I'm 44 now and um, when I played lacrosse in college, there was no holding back. <laughs> it was just, you know, every, what we call ground ball, so if the ball's on the ground, you have to go get it. Everything I would chase down and people would compare me to Dick Butkus, I guess, who was a <laughs> Chicago Bears yep. uh, football player. Cause I just, I, I, if, if something was there and I needed to get it and do it, I, I would go. So that competitive spirit was there, but now it's different in, in triathlons. It's, almost a way to mentally clear my head. And I just feel so lucky to have that opportunity to be able to see what my body can do. And, and an instructor I work with too, she always said at the end of a workout, thank your body for what it's allowed, for, allowed you to do that day. And I thought that was really cool. Whereas in lacrosse, I would just be like, ah, like why, could, you know, why couldn't I get that? Or how come I didn't score that goal? And it was very, a little bit more of a negative connotation when I would mess up. But yeah. now I'm like, hey, look, I'm out here and competing, and um, I try to dedicate races to people too. So I'll I'll do a triathlon for you know a family member, or somebody who's passed away in my life, and I and I get that inner spirit from them, and I feel like Very that cool. channels me to move forward too. It's the New York Marathon that I ran virtually this past weekend. Uh, my uncle had passed away a couple of years ago, and and he grew up in looking at the World Trade Center and New York was everything to him. And he was a big, he, he ran at the Penn Relay. So running was a big thing for him. And you know, I, I just, I just felt him pushing behind me. I'm like, okay, I got this. I got this. That's <laughs> awesome. That's really cool. That's yeah. That's an, that's inspiring for sure. Now, one of those things when you're done with the triathlon and, and kind of done with your workout and everything else, how much kind of goes into recovery or kind of keeping your body in shape and in like whether it's stretching or because that's kind of one of those areas that's always overlooked i feel like and especially for athletes and younger people uh that's how injuries kind of build up right you you lift a bunch or you run a bunch you're like okay that's done now i'll just go on with my day and i'll sit at a desk for four or five hours in the same position while those hip flexors tighten right up or yes. whatever else it's going to be right a hundred percent um you know and 
you do have to be savvy with that. I think when you're younger, it doesn't matter as much. And in college, I would just sit in the ice bath and hang out. And that was also very fun and social too. But then as you get a little bit older, you do have to protect your joints. One thing that I use a lot is turmeric. So I take that as a supplement, which, which helps a lot to decrease inflammation in the body. And and ginger does the same thing. There's actually Mm -hmm. great um, papers on turmeric and the benefits of turmeric. Okay. So that's one just to decrease overall inflammation. Then I do like the compressive boots. So those um, pneumatic compressive compressive boots, there's different okay. um, brands. And they really help to bring a lot of the lymph system, a lot of the venous pooling from your foot, from your leg. And they'll help your legs recover really easily. Um, you know, I know you guys use them with the USP team as well as um, we use them with US lacrosse. And it makes a big difference. It's also really great if you're traveling on long haul flights. Um, it helps your legs recover during that time too. And then the other thing is I think some sort of massage. Now they have all these great tools where you can buy a device that, that really helps to do some of that kneading of the muscles. And you know, you just it's like a little massage gun that you can use on your body. And that works really well too. So I, I find those three things to be really helpful and ice. So, so sitting in some sort of ice bath at the end of it. But it's critical. I, I will admit I'm not the best at stretching. So my, my trainer does stretch me a couple times a week and <laughs> he doesn't do that. And I don't know, but um, yeah, the, the foam rollers are great to have. And then those yoga bands, the ropes that you can um, hold your leg and move that in different directions. It's key because if you're not flexible in your, especially your posterior chain, which is your hamstrings, your um, calf muscles, that puts a lot of pressure, just like you're saying, on your, your hips and your knees. And a lot of ACL pairs are actually avoided by keeping all of that pliable in, in the back of your leg and keeping it strong. So you can uh, decrease your risk of ACL injury by keeping your core and your glutes and your hamstrings strong, flexible, and uh, very pliable. Right. No, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things that I <clears throat> remember when we were always, at least when I was competing, and how important kind of the hamstring was, at least in our sport, kind of like skiing and how especially with skiing bogles and stuff like that, you'd kind of have such a quad dominant sport and we would really emphasize and try to make sure that those hamstrings are taken care of because kind of that's your last line of defense when you kind of get into that vulnerable position. Yeah. That hamstring will really kind of save you. Mm-hmm. It's the same for the field sport too. That is mm-hmm. key. And I spend a lot of time educating people about it, but yeah, build up, build up those thigh muscles. Yeah, I got to keep those going. Yeah. Now, uh, one thing I know that you actually do with my wife, uh, what was it, a year and a half ago? I'm trying to think of when. The, oh, the, yeah. Uh, in, yes, in, okay. uh, in New York City for uh, a keeper in the game with yeah. the Women, uh, Sports Foundation with uh, ESPNW, Lululemon, right. a bunch of people there. And, and kind of just speak about uh, that event a little bit and sure. kind of what that means. Yeah. So this is a huge passion for me. Um, Keeper in the Game was brought to you by the company you mentioned, and then I work at HSS, so they allowed us to put something super, super cool together. And I go to these ESPN Women in Sports conferences, and I try to get a take-home point for something. So if I'm going to a conference, I want some actual go-to moments that I can take out and I'm going to do something with. Mm -hmm. So one of the conferences talked about there was a high dropout rate for girls playing sports around the adolescent age as they're going through puberty, somewhere between 11 to 16, they just start dropping out of sports. So they may enjoy the recreational soccer games, but then they don't continue to play at the club level or with their middle school or junior high school. I thought that was absolutely astonishingly horrible because One of the reasons that I'm an orthopedic surgeon today is because I played sports. I think that gave me the confidence, the grit, the resiliency to be able to make it as an orthopedic surgeon. There are also a lot of studies through Ernst & Young and ESPN has worked on some studies too, just showing that in order to make it to the C-suite in a lot of companies, you know, CEO, COO, it does really help to get that sports background going. Mm -hmm. So... I decided that I would work with HSS because they, they always want to keep people moving and, and keep people going. And it would be great to have a leadership conference for our younger girls, again, somewhere in that age, 11 to 16, where they build up that confidence and get to see other people who have been through the same thing. They're relatable. Um, so we took it from everything between coming in and we had um, 
one of my friends, Krista Samara, she runs this confidence training camp. So everybody's in this room and you're like, I am this, I am that. And, you know, just, just really yelling and screaming just how confident you are. And you could see parents crying. They've just never seen their girls that, you know, ferocious with telling them what they were doing. So we started with that and that kind of broke the ice. And then we did talk about some interesting top topics of what the different types of sports bars are when you, when you play sports. Um, what tampons are, because some of them hadn't started their periods, how to really, how your body can change athletically during that time um, of your getting your period too. And then we brought in different topics of various leaders. And so one was just great athletes and how they overcame some challenges in their lives to compete at this amazing level. And the final one was more of a, a leadership conference. So women who um, one of them was a WNBA player. Another um, was the um, COO for um, the, the WNBA and different, different cool. people who were involved in sports from a leadership level. And they gave advice as well. So you don't always have to go through your career path as being, I like sports. I want to be a professional athlete. You, I like sports. I can do these professional roles too. Mm -hmm. And by the end, it was just great feedback. And we tried to keep it lighthearted and involved and, uh, we had some, during lunchtime, we had a little nutritional talk by one of my colleagues, Heidi Skolnick, and then we had a yoga talking about stretching, which I, I definitely benefited from that too. Um, but it was cool. It was just covering a lot of bases and getting their girls to really try to stay in their sport. And so not, so, I mean, I know you touched a little bit on like the, the parents response, you know, some of them in tears and stuff like that, but I mean, what was the overall response from from all these 11 to 60 i mean that had to be super influential for them and and had to really be uh just fun to see them smiling and and it was, screaming it was just great it was just kind of this like raw moment where they were ready to if you told them you gotta go out and get this done i, I think they would um there's this cool book that um strong is the new beautiful where this photographer takes pictures of girls in, in different i would say non female gender roles, you know, okay. rolling around in mud or, um, you know, just, just playing with worms, things that, you know, we tend to be put into these gender roles that aren't always appropriate. And, um, you know, my friends who all played a lot of sports where it required really strong leg muscle, like, mm -hmm. man, like, why can't they make jeans for athletes? Why I just can't <laughs> put our thighs into these jeans? And, and so I love the message of strong is the new um, beautiful, where embrace those strong thighs, you know, and embrace those biceps and really kind of wear them with confidence as opposed to, wow, you know, you, you can't see the space between my two thighs and my jeans and um, I'm not a, a supermodel type. Um, I, I mean, I remember going through that in, in high school and college and, you know, you, sometimes you look at people and you're like, oh, I, I wish I looked like her, but it's nice now. I think we're getting a better message out to our, our young female athletes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's an absolutely fantastic message, especially with like as you kind of touched on that 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 other view, and it gets it's so difficult right now, especially with social media and how much, especially younger kids, and I know the ones that I've coached and everything. There's just you can you can just tell they're on social media, they're being affected by the influencers and everything else, and it's just like you're 11, just go out and be a kid. I like I don't you know, go run around. It doesn't matter. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> but that's why sports is so cool because it, it breaks so many barriers. I mean, you know, between racial barriers, socioeconomic barriers, the, you know, being pretty, not pretty. Um, I remember coming out of a lacrosse game and you couldn't tell the color of our skin as we were walking up seeing our parents because there was just mud everywhere. <laughs> and um, it's just fun. That's where, like, sports are just, it's just such a great equalizer, I think, in life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've done a great job of kind of continuing to to keep those sports, uh, at least in your life, endorphins going and, and triathlons. And I'm going to have to, I think that I've never done more than a 5k. So All maybe right. I'll have to, I'll have to, I used to actually be, I was, so one 5k, I ran like two or three 5ks and like 18, 11, which was like, but it's not a bad, like for someone that doesn't run awesome. at all. Yeah. So I was like, okay, maybe I need it. But that was so, it was so like 10, 15 years ago. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I don't know. You'd be surprised. It really, <laughs> it does. Um, the runs now just have a, have a great way to clear your head. So 
you know, if you don't, if you can't meditate that day, then go out and get running. Absolutely. Now, kind of uh, as you were as you were touching on a little bit earlier, I'm just kind of curious: who are some some people that have helped influence you, kind of along the way? You know, you've always talked about the team and all the different people around, you know, support systems and, and stuff like that to help you kind of attack the day. But who are some of those uh, people that have really influenced and kind of helped you along the way throughout your life? The first, I would say, obviously, my parents. Um, specifically, working with my dad, he was a cardiologist, and okay. They have pictures of me, I guess he was reading all the EKGs. And so at that point they were not digital. So you have to go through and look at all the check marks on them and, and read all the different ways and measure them. And so I would sit next to him and I, I don't think I could even write words at the time, but his words were illegible anyway. <laughs> so I would uh, start copying what he was writing and pretend like I was looking at EKGs. So I always was intrigued by the medical component and I would go in and see what he did at work. Um, he actually, when I started looking into the surgical route, he had me spend time with what he thought were some, I guess, meaner, there's probably other terms for it, female surgeons, who he were, he was like, well, if she spends time with them, there's no way she's going to be a surgeon. <laughs> and I come out there, I'm like, that was awesome. I had such a great time. I definitely want to be a surgeon. And he's like, oh, that was an epic fail right there. That, that backfired. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so my dad always, I, I don't think he ever said, I don't think that's a good idea, unless obviously it was unsafe or, or not going down the right path. But he always encouraged us to, you know, gave us wings and let us fly. And um, if we did fail at different things, you know, had struggled with a, you know, cell biology test, he would be there to lift us back up. I remember calling him in a procedure one time and I got a C plus on a cell bio test, which was just the lowest grade I've ever gotten. And um, I was crying, like, there's no way, I'm never going to be a doctor, it's, it, it's all over, you know, just, just throw in the towel, and uh, and his nurse was in the room, and she's like, hold on, your dad's right here, and uh, and so he would he would talk, talk me through it, but he always just had so much just belief in us, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and really gave us um, the, the tool to try to challenge ourselves however we could. Um, and then the, the next person was my coach in, in college. Um, going into college, playing lacrosse, my role as an athlete was mainly just, I was a midfield defender, so I, it was fitness. So basically mm -hmm. run faster than anybody else, be stronger than anybody else, um, and just get the job done. And so, you know, she would put me, whoever the leading scorer was on the other team. Um, but I guess when they were looking at me as an athlete and deciding if where I would fit on the team. She called her dad one time and she's like, I don't know, like this girl, she can barely catch a throw, you know, she's not like <laughs> other girls. And, um, and her dad was a big uh, college coach. I forget, it was, it was um, somewhere in, in Philadelphia. A college okay. there. And he was like, you got to take her because I can tell you in a game, she is going to be the one to get stuff done. It may not be pretty. It may not be the way that you want her to do it, but she'll get it done. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I started and played every game at Duke and uh, and she gave me that green light to just go ahead. And then probably the biggest conversation I had with her was when um, I was a sophomore captain and then going into being a junior captain. And we went from probably three and, I don't know what it was, three and 11 or something the first year to then going to the final four. But wow. to reach that point, she had a heart to heart with me and she was like, look, you're a leader on this team and I get it. You lead by example, you work hard, but times are changing and I need you to be a vocal leader. I need you to step up and I need you to get your teammates to do everything that you're doing in the weight room and, and on the field. Um, because at that point, you know, some of the girls didn't want to get big muscles or, or didn't, you know, there was a little bit of a hesitation to go into yeah, the and, and do the strength and conditioning training um, as well as some of our, you know, the sprint work and, and all that just, you know, you just want to throw up afterwards, all, all that stuff. And so I was like, okay, you know, I, I walked in there, all right, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best with that. <laughs> and then the first practice that after that conversation, I could hear just staring me down and we were doing these shuttle runs and I'm like, okay, you got this girl, let's go. And she just stared me down and she, I could tell she wanted <laughs> me to be more vocal. And every day I kind of, learned it more and more. And by the end, um, everybody remembers this one speech I did before this 
in the midst of this final four game where we were losing and battling it out. And I just called this time out and you better believe I was very vocal at that point. So <laughs> she did make me into more of a leader, I would say in, in, in my life. And then the final one was Dr. Mormon, who um, he's a, he now runs Ortho Carolinas down in North Carolina. And I met him during medical school and he was basically like, you are going to be an orthopedic surgeon. It was like Uncle Sam telling me, <laughs> you are going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And he, there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. A mentor mm -hmm. kind of gives you that rah-rah moment and you can do it and they, they support you. You can call them. A sponsor is somebody who puts you in positions to succeed. So right. I would say he was both a mentor and a sponsor to me, mm -hmm. which I'm learning that distinction as I'm trying to guide some of our younger orthopedic surgeons and, and put them in the right direction. But he would make me do a presentation for a meeting or he would put me on a role in a committee that maybe I was a little bit nervous about. Um, so it wasn't just talk, it was a lot of action for me too. And then and then by the time I had to apply for orthopedic residency, I felt like I did check the boxes to be a good applicant there. And, and that kudos to him for uh, making me feel, feel prepared there. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's fantastic. And it's one of those things that's really overlooked uh, now. I mean, it's one of those things I feel like at least like coaching wise, the younger kids and stuff like that, they're all like, okay, you know, everything's videoed, everything's hold my hand, this and this. And then when you're like not around, they don't right. know. They have no idea what to do. Like, uh, like, okay, we're just going to, we're just going to do a day where I'm not going to coach you. Tell me how you feel. Yeah. Like, how yeah. does this feel when you're doing it? Feel it for yourself because you know, there's not always a coach, but it's really, I mean, I think that that's really kind of profound to be able to sink or swim, right. Put you in the right positions, yep. stretch you kind of a little bit out of your comfort yeah. zone. Like, Ugh, all right, this <laughs> is really nice. a little bit uneasy, but it kind of takes that, that plunge, right. For you to be able to kind of gain that confidence and be like, Hey, you can do this. This isn't that hard. Like, yeah. And it's good to have failures. If you don't have the failures, if your life is just cruising along, you, you haven't achieved as much as you can achieve, you know, in order, both in sports and our, our career wise, you, you have to get a little bit punched in the face sometimes and, and pick yourself up, but then you're going to be tougher and stronger as, as you get back up. Yeah, no, I mean, that's one of those great things I actually wanted to talk to you about a little bit was uh, kind of perseverance. And kind of being able, um, because those things aren't always uh, rolling and going in the right direction. So for you, like, what what was able to help you kind of persevere through some of those tough times? Was it that simple kind of consistency that you had built as you kind of build out your day and, and kind of keep track of everything? Would that, would that help you kind of through some of those tougher times? Or, or what was it for you? Probably the, the toughest, one of the toughest times I went through, at least in my career, was when I, I was the first woman to do the sports medicine fellowship at, up in Boston. And at the time, you work with all these different teams. You work with the Red Sox, the Bruins, the Patriots. Um, and it, it's a great opportunity. Um, you work with the New England Revolution. But initially, you know, I started working with all these teams, and then I was told I wasn't able to go on the field for the Patriots. And it was, mm. you know, you could you could guess why I wasn't allowed <laughs> to go on the field with the Patriots. All the, all the other people who were all allowed to go on the field with the Patriots, they were all men before me and, and I was the first woman. And um, so somebody Crazy. with a cut off, cut off sweatshirt uh, basically, you know, felt mm. like I wasn't able to get out there. And that, that was a shock. I would say that was a, that was a complete shock. And um, so to get through that required a lot of diligence. I, I grabbed from different aspects of my life, um, ethics, friends. Um, so I, I, I think one of the first things I do is I really like to involve my friends and family in, in situations because they've known me for a long time <laughs> and they know what I want to achieve. They know where I've been and they can kind of make a really nice, guided decision based on that. So I relied a lot on the support of my friends, as well as a lot of my educators too. The, um, Dr. Freelander who ran my residency program was very ethical. He was always supporting women, minorities in orthopedic surgery. And so he gave me a lot of sound advice there too, where, you know, I started approaching some of the other people that I worked with in the fellowship. And they were like, look, like, some people empathized with me and they were like, why don't you start just taking care of the New England Revolution and that's going to be your team. And 
it was the coolest experience. So I, I kind of made, you know, lemonade out of lemons where <laughs> yeah. my buddies who they were covering the Patriots, they still were at the back of the bus and kind of treat, you know, it's not a glamour position. But yeah. uh, when I worked with the revolution, it was actually one of my buddies who um, played soccer at Duke. He was on the team at the time, this guy Jay Heaps. And he was so cool. He's like, Kara, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm your doctor. He's like, oh, well, I'm your athlete. And, so we were <laughs> no out there and uh, you know, I would, I would take my heels off and we'd warm up together a little bit. And it just, it was so much fun. So to be able to get that experience again, and I would say I had, the coaches were so respectful. And then the Red Sox actually got wind of it too. And so Big Poppy would get me my lunch every day when we were at spring training, he would come up and, hey, Doc, let's go, you know, let's get lunch. Very cool. I don't know, like I'm happy to be at the back of the line. But so, so I think aside from that support group, having a positive spirit, Mm -hmm. with it is, is really really helpful it, it would be easy to again go in a dark hole and um say oh woe is me but don't feel sorry for yourself i mean so many people have gone through worse challenges in life but pick yourself up and figure out there could be some really interesting path that's gonna um be better than that scenario too yeah you never know what kind of door is gonna open right. next or is right around the corner right what opportunity is kind of waiting for you there Exactly. Now, uh, uh, one thing I was kind of just curious about for people that essentially would want to get into the medical field, ortho, mm -hmm. uh, surgeon, or just anything in the medical field, what kind of advice uh, would you have for them to to help them kind of through when they're navigating through some of that uh, perseverance or dark times? And, and what kind of words of wisdom would you have for them? I think preparedness is key when, okay. when you're going through... Um, a couple challenges in medical school, I would say particularly, are when you're taking your boards um, because those scores and grades, um, they do matter as you're going into residency. And I, through some of my colleagues at HSS, we've looked at confidence in female surgeons mm -hmm. and seen that just like you were alluding to coaching, you know, female athletes versus male athletes, there's a way that at least generally as a, a female surgeon can feel more confident going into things is just being prepared. So if you start understanding, okay, I'll give you an example of the board test. So the board in, in medical school, it covers so many different, um, you know, resources, it covers so many different topics that it just seems overwhelming. So if you look at it from the beginning, you think you're climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and you're like, man, I'm never going to get there. This is never going to happen. <laughs> but if you start kind of writing, again, alluding to the Mount Kilimanjaro reference, you start putting your equipment list together. Okay, so I can do this. And here are the references that I need to do and, and get organized with that. And then, all right, Mount Kilimanjaro, here's the training I need to do beforehand. I, I think I need to um, work with this doctor a little bit more and see how he treats that you know, kidney disease differently. Mm -hmm. and, and start just kind of building your repertoire. It, it's really, it can be really intimidated to just look at the peak of the mountain and say, I need to get there. Yeah. How are you going to get there? And, and what are you going to do at this hour to get there? Not what are you going to do, you know, over the next three months, but just at this hour, just start doing something. And I think doing is critical. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of just talking about stuff for long periods of time, but just, just start doing. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, then you'll get to the next step and the next step and, and you can conquer those things. Just start doing. It's like, uh, have you, have you seen what about Bob? Yeah. <laughs> baby steps, baby steps to the elevator, baby steps in the hallway. Oh, it I works. <laughs> yeah, just keep doing it. It's so true, though, because it is so easy to just see this, you know, veil in front of you that you're like, there's no way I can get there. But people do it and, and you can do it, too. No, absolutely. So what is, uh, what's the future look like for you? When do you got your uh, Iron half uh, Iron Man coming up? Is that yeah, Has that kind of been broken um, up with COVID or how is that? Oh yeah, COVID's great. It's kind of fast with COVID. It's awesome. um, I'm just praying, you know, now we're going into more of those species and I'm just, I'm just praying we can keep that going. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really enjoy being outside. So from, you know, both the personal and the medical side, the COVID pandemic has brought a lot of us outside more. We were doing way more open water swims and, oh, 100%. You know, and cycling. So embrace nature, embrace outdoors. Um, so this is getting into more of my off season. So I'll probably do a little bit more of that 4.15 a.m. boxing. Um, but it's a lot of um, kind of recovering. So the New York Marathon tends to end my triathlon and marathon season. 
and then I'll work on more strength and conditioning, building up that strength and conditioning, um, getting a little bit more of that flexibility. Yoga, Pilates are, are great for that. And then uh, skiing, hoping to hoping to get a lot of skiing done and work on that core that way too. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's core is important. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for for taking the time for for people out there. Where can they kind of uh, look up or, or find you on uh, social sure. media or online? So both Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Karen Sutton MD. So just first name, last name, Karen Sutton, and then MD. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out there and follow along. Perfect. Well, thank you uh, so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It's been a blast. Thanks, Bobby. It's great to great to be here. Yeah, hopefully we'll get Have to meet again uh, soon in person, actually. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Perfect. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that little bell button so you get notified every time a new episode drops. Thanks.